Section 15.5 is about curl and divergence, and um, these are not like opposite concepts, but they are um, a little bit different from one another. If you have a strong curl, you're not going to have a strong divergence and vice versa. So I want to just do a couple of pictures first to describe the difference. Um, this is the first picture I want to take a look at, and it's just from your book. Um, this is a really good image to keep in mind when you think of curl. Curl has to do with how something is rotating. Okay, so imagine that the arrows, which are vectors, of course, are representing fluid and motion. All right, so it's how some kind of a fluid is flowing over this surface. And we can do this in 3D as well. There's nothing special about this picture versus a 3D picture. But curl is the idea of how something is rotating in that, how that fluid is rotating. Okay? Um, the other one, I put it in a little bit later, but I don't think it fits there very well is divergence. We'll get to that one second in a few slides here. Divergence is the idea of how something is flowing or expanding outward. Okay, so obviously if, yeah, an outward in space, or this is two-dimensional, you know, so it's outward in the plane, but it's sort of how it's moving away from the center of the object. So the curl is how it's moving around it, and the divergence is how it's moving away. So clearly those things aren't exactly opposites, but they aren't exactly non-related either, right? If you've got something that's completely going around in a spiral, then it's eventually going to go outward too. But you could also have something, so like this image right here, doesn't appear to have any sort of circular motion to it, correct? And this image over here doesn't really seem to be going outward at all. So you don't have to have one or the other, but that is the idea of how those are sort of related to one another, okay? So we're gonna start with curl and talk about how we find the curl of a vector field. All right, so this is our first definition. This is definition 5.1. The curl of a vector field f of x, y, z is f sub 1, that is the first function of x, y, z, f sub 2 of x, y, z, f sub 3 of x, y, z. This is the vector field And then we take this new notation, so it says curl of f. And I'm going to write it out sort of longhand, and then I'll show you an easier way to think about it um, just very shortly. So this is del f3 del y minus del f2 del z i hat plus del f1 del z minus del f3 del x j hat plus del f2 del x minus del f1 del y k hat. Who's had linear algebra? Ooh, almost all of you. Not, not quite, but almost all of you. This should feel like something you've seen in linear algebra. It should feel like something we did back in Calc 3, actually, as well, which was beckoning back to linear algebra. Does anybody know what this should feel like? It's cross-product. It's cross-product, absolutely. So it's much easier to remember as a cross-product than this ugly formula, agree? I don't want to remember the ugly formula. You saw me looking at my notes, right? I don't, I don't know the ugly formula. But the cross-product notation is a lot easier to work with. So what we're going to do is this is the gradient crossed with the vector field F of the determinant I, J, K. And this is del, del X, del, del Y, 
del, del z, and then it's f1, f2, f3. So everything goes in its place, looks great. Um, and then we can do the determinant for this. So when you do the determinant, do you remember how you do it? Like with your hands physically, what you do? That's one way to do it. That's not how I was always thought, taught to do it. The way I was taught, was taught to do it was to cover things up. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Maybe I never showed you. Dr. Nichols taught this day. Oh, well, that could be why. That's how I do it, Nathan. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to mark out, um, let me see which one I start with because I don't remember. We're going to do I hat. So if we're doing I hat, we're using this matrix down here. Okay, so we sort of mark out this column that I's in and the row that I's in, and we use this two dimensional you know, determinant down here. And the way you do determine is you mark down this one diagonal and then up the other diagonal and it's subtraction. So if I do I hat, then I'm going to mark down F3. So this is del F3 del Y minus del F2 del X. Uh, del Z, sorry. So let me use a little bit of color in this. So this is the matrix that I'm working with right here. And I'm multiplying down this diagonal, and I'm subtracting up this diagonal. So it has this sort of cross-multiplication feel to it back from um, some algebra course you took in high school, I'm sure. Um, so you end up getting uh, what you're really getting, and I'll write it out once because I apparently didn't teach it to you guys before, is you have del, del y, f3. So this is this lower matrix, um, well, the determinant of this lower lower matrix and it's I hat and then it's subtraction the next sign is actually subtraction so we do the same thing with J hat but the signs alternate so we're going to start here now with J and we mark out the middle column and the top row still so we're going to go this diagonal and we're going to do this diagonal with a negative in front so we've got the same determinant kind of feature that we had at the first one and if you don't like this method you don't have to do this it's fine um, but this is one way to think about it. So this is F1, del, del Z, F3, and we have J hat. And then we can do this, the last one, and it's addition, and we're going to do the same thing. Let me move this over. Try this again. So, and then the last one, when we cover up the K column, we are getting this first matrix. And it is addition on the last one, too. I think I just said that. So you have del, del X, del, del Y, F sub 1, F sub 2, K hat. And then your diagonals follow. So when you take this and you do your diagonals, you get the exact same formula that you got above right here. So I won't rewrite it. I'll just copy it. Alright, so we have a cross product, like you guys said. Fantastic. So we're going to find the curl. Alright? I'm going to do a couple of examples. Find the curl of each vector. The first vector we're going to do is y squared i plus 4x squared y j. You notice you don't have anything k, right? So if you want to think about it, basically you've got 0k. It's not present there, and you can deal with it from a three-dimensional perspective then, so it'll sort of model what we've already created before instead of having a separate equation for this. All right, so I would set up a determinant, i, j, k. If you really don't want to set up determinants and you just want to memorize that formula, you can do that. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Um, so what we want is we want the derivative in each one of these locations, um, del x, del del x, del del y, 
del del z. Whoops. And we want the formula of each of the functions in the, that's below them. So the i component has the, the equation, if you will, um, y squared. J has the equation 4x squared y. And K has the equation of 0. Sorry, that's so sloppy. I should have written it a little bit bigger. Wonderful things sort of happen because there's a 0 involved. Lots of zeros happen, actually. That's, that's the wonderful things that happen. Um, so the first one, when we look at the lower right-hand matrix, um, we actually end up with 0 minus, and then now I need the derivative right here of 4x squared y with respect to z, z which means I would get 0, right? I get lots of zeros on that, actually, because I don't have any z's in the form formula either. So this is 0 minus 0 i hat. All right, now I'm going to use the outer two columns, um, and I've got a subtraction sign automatically with this because I'm in the middle term for my j. So in the outer column, I get a 0 again because I'm taking the top corner and on the bottom corner over here underneath k, which is a 0. And then when I do the second one, the same thing happens, doesn't it? Because I don't have any z's in y squared. So this is another 0 minus 0, j hat. And then I have plus, and I'm finally going to get something non-zero here in a moment. So now I need to do this corner over here. Um, and so first I need to do the top left to bottom right diagonal. So I'm going to take 4x squared y with respect to x. And what is that derivative? 8xy. 8xy, very good. And then I have minus, and I need the other diagonal, y squared with respect to y, which is 2y. And then this is k hat. Yep. Um, so written as a vector, this would be the vector 0, 0, and then 8xy minus 2y. And we do get vectors because this is a cross product, right? So our answer is actually a vector when we're done. So having no k in the problem, having no z's in the problem is a very nice thing actually to have happen. So let's do one that actually has those in there so we can see something not so nice. Um, all right. Same directions, new problem. Number two is x e to the x, because we haven't had an e in a while, y z squared and x plus y. We're going to set this up, I, J, K, del, del, X, del, del, Y, del, del, K, I'm oh, sorry, Z, get the right letter in there, um, and then the functions that we have, so this is X, E to the X, Z, no wonder that doesn't look right, this is a Z, the exponent on the E is Z. Please change that for me, I'm sorry. X e to the z. And then we had y z squared and x plus y. All right. This diagonal, what do I get for d dy? 1 minus the second diagonal. All right, 2yz, because this is respect to z. This is, oops. Okay, let me do my notation, my vector when I'm done, the other notation that I was going to do. This is uh, i. All right, subtraction sign. I need to do the outer columns. This is just the awkward one, I think, to do because you have to ignore the middle column. But uh, we need to do the outer column of x, y with respect to x, which gives me 1. And then the outer column uh, of x, e to the z with respect to z, which gives me what? x, e to the z. And this is j. Plus, now I need my first corner matrix um, of d dx um, del del x with, for y z squared. 
zero, thank you. And then I need del del y of x e to the z. That one's also zero. So I don't actually end up with a k component on this one, or a k component of zero, if you will. Um, so my value, now we didn't have this to worry about this last time because it was zero in the middle. This negative will distribute through, so our signs do in fact change. So my vector ends up being one minus two y z, and then x e to the z minus one, and then zero. Any questions on that one? Cross products, you always know how to do this, right? Yeah, okay. So let's do divergence next. This is definition 5-2. I feel like we should be talking about a movie. The divergence of the vector field different line last time and it looked a little weird. So let's do f of x, y, z, which is the function f1 of x, y, z, the function f2 of x, y, z, <coughs> and then the function f sub 3 of x, y, z. Is the scalar function The notation is divergence, like dive, D-I-V. Div is what it really looks like of f of x, y, z, which is del f 1 del x plus del f 2 del y plus del f 3 del z. And this, of course, is only when it's defined, points where it's defined. Do you know what this one is? This is the dot product, right? So this is the dot product of F1, F2, F3 with the del, del x, del, del y, del, del z. Hmm? Yes. Except that it's addition and not a vector when you're done. The gradient would be a vector when you're done, right? It's the same components, though, that you're getting. What you're thinking is right on the component parts of it, yeah. Okay, so this one should be easier to calculate, right? Dot products are easier to do than cross products. They're a little less complicated. Um, so we're going to find the divergence of the same vectors that we did before, okay? So same vectors above. I'll put them back on here, of course, but that's the, those are the ones we're going to use. So the first one, oh, I labeled them still 1 and 2 since we're using the same vectors. Um, y squared i hat plus 4x squared y j hat. All right, so, oops, didn't mean to hit equals there. We want the divergence now. Uh, let me give this a name. Let me just call this capital F so that I don't have to rewrite it again. The divergence of F. So what are we going to do? Starting here at the beginning, what do we do? Yeah, the derivative with respect to x. If you would like to write them out separately to help you remind yourself which pieces you're doing, you can do that. So you're doing the derivative of, with respect to x of y squared. That's where we're starting. You don't have to write this down, but you can if you'd like. This one would be 0. We're going to add that to the derivative of the second one with respect to y. So that's of the 4x squared y which would be 
I'm sorry. Yes, 4x squared, thank you. So it would be 4x squared. And then we would do del del z of 0, which would be 0. So this ends up giving me 4x squared. And depending on what the coordinates for x were, we could actually calculate the divergence at a specific point. Okay. So not too complicated. Let's do one more. The same one that we did before, number 2. We've got x e to the z, y z squared, and x plus y. Um, alternate notation, just for fun, we can do this as f1 sub x, right? Because we called f1 the first function. So if we do f1 and we do the x e to the z with respect to x, what do we get? e to the z. And we'll do the second function, f sub 2, with respect to y, which would give me z squared. And we'll do the third one, f sub 3, with respect to z. And that gives me 0. And then to do the divergence of what I'm calling f, I didn't actually write it in up there, but let's call that f. So the divergence of f would be to do what? Add those together. e to the z plus z squared, and then plus the 0, of course, but that won't affect. So far, so good? Okay. Try to decide how much I just want to write and how much I just want to say. One of the things that we'll do later, this is in 15.7, which will happen next class period is that we're going to show that the divergence of a vector field at a point corresponds to the net flow of fluid per unit volume out of a box. Okay, so that's how we're going to use this later. Um, so let me write down a detail about that. This seems like it might be something you'd need in your notes. If the gradient, the dot product of x, y, z is greater than zero, then more fluid exits than enters. And we call this the source. And there is a picture in your book, I don't know why I didn't pick a picture of this one like I did the other ones, but this is figure 15.38a. I've forgotten to do that at this point. So source is where something starts, right? You think of the source of a river, it's where the river begins, so it's moving away from this idea. Um, and then, of course, if we have the gradient of uh, dot product with the vector field f of x, y, z, these are vector fields, sorry and this is less than zero, then what would that mean? It yeah, more fluid enters than exits. So more, more fluid is entering. And we have a name for this. Any idea what that might be called? <laughs> we call it a sink. Um, that's actually what you hear used um, in sort of geographical terms, I guess you'd say, or nature terms as well, when you have something that sort of flows into it, it's called a sink. And this is in figure 15. I don't have it written down. I think there's a figure of this in your book. Maybe there wasn't, and that's why I didn't actually decide to put that in. Um, it might be 38B. That's possible. Um, there's one other possibility. What have I not said here? Yeah, if the gradient dot product with the vector field equals zero, what does that mean? <laughs> we call the vector field, you guys are very creative. I don't know exactly why we call it source free and not sink free, but source free. 
or, and here's a better word that doesn't depend on one of this or the other, incompressible. Incompressible. Um, and let me just make a comment that this is all happening throughout a region D. All right, so it doesn't have to have this equal to zero everywhere. It doesn't have to be greater than zero everywhere. It just has to be in some region. It's kind of like when we talk about relative maximums, relative minimums, like that idea. You know, in a region, in an area of the picture of the graph, um, we're looking at these details. Okay. A couple of examples we're going to look at with this one. So here's our first example. We're going to determine whether the Giffen vector field is incompressible. with first is the vector y squared, or the vector field y squared, x squared, e to the z, and oops, cosine xy. What is it that we're really going to be finding about this? I mean, like, we added this new sort of layer of terminology onto stuff called incompressible, but what is it all incompressible doing? Dot product. It's asking about divergence, which is dot product, right? Okay, so we're actually asked to find basically the divergence of what's going on here. And again, we'll give this a name F so that we have something that we can notationally write down with this. So we're going to find the divergence of F. And the divergence of F is the dot product. So I need the first component with respect to X, which would be what? Zero. The second component with respect to Y, which would be zero. And the third component with respect to Z, which would be zero. So this is zero. So what does that tell me? It's incompressible. <laughs> okay, easy enough? Right? We're just, it's just one extra step beyond finding the divergence, right? We're just making the decision based on the divergence if it satisfies that condition or not. We'll do another one. This is sine of x. 2y squared cube root of z. And we're going to find the divergence. So, what do you have? That was sine 2i and x. <laughs> Cosine of x is how it'll start. Good. And then what? Plus 4y. And then what? One third z to the negative two thirds. So this is divergence. So now what? What now, Nathan? We're done. What do we know? This is not zero, so what? Not incompressible. Oh, I thought you were trying to say whether it's sinkers or it's two, so it's like, oh, no. No, it didn't ask us to do that. I mean, it could have asked us to do that, but I don't think the directions do that in this particular section. We'll talk more about it maybe in 15.7. I haven't done the notes for that yet, so I'm not sure. Um, but it has to be in a region, D, and that would be just at one particular point. Oh. So you've got to be sort of in a local area for that to work. There's got to be a, a region in which it works. All right.
Theorem 5.1, this is the last information in this section that we're going to take a look at. I said, no, it is 5. I said 5.1 and it actually is 5.1. I keep saying 5 in chapter 15. So this says, suppose that the vector field f of x, y, z is exactly the way we've been defining it. So it's f sub 1 of x, y, z f sub 2 of x, y, z, and f sub 3 of x, y, z is a vector field. Whose components f1, f2, f3 have continuous first-order partial derivatives. Throughout an open region D contained in R3. If F is conservative on D, then gradient cross product with F is the zero vector. It's another way of finding what? Yes. So we're actually going to use this theorem backwards, basically, right? What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking this result and we're going to be seeing whether or not this result holds. Now, if that result actually equals zero, we actually don't know that it's conservative. This, this logic does not work this direction. But if the result's not zero, we know it's not conservative. You guys had enough logic to remember how that works? Basically, what we're doing is we're doing a contrapositive sort of argument. We're saying P implies Q. So we're going to assume or find Q. And we're going to say, if I can find out that Q is not going to work, then it's going to mean that P does not work as well. Okay, so that's a logic argument that we do um, in a couple different classes here. But So we're going to find out. That was not what I wanted to do. Let me move over here and try that again. Our directions are going to be to determine whether the given vector field and we're going to do the examples we just did so above is conservative. So example three that we did above was y squared x squared e to the z and cosine of x, y. So we're going to get to practice one more time finding what now? Curl. Got it. So we're going to find the curl of f. Again, we'll call this f. All right, so this is I, J, K, del, del, X, del, del, Y, 
del del z. Now you're really appreciating the divergence formula, right? y squared, x squared, e to the z, cosine xy. All right, so for starters, what do I have? Close. Okay, so I'm going to have sine. So sine of xy, and then what? Right, the derivative of cosine is, well, it's negative sine, actually, right? Negative, negative sine of xy, and then what do I need? We need an x because we do we need an x or do we need a y? Okay, okay good. Making sure you guys are following through with what you're saying because <laughs> I'm hearing multiple things. Let me move uh, this negative at the beginning, and so you want a, a negative x here, right? Does that work? Negative x sine x y. All right, then what happens? Minus minus what? x squared e to the z, right? Okay, and this is times i hat. Minus. Now we're going to do the j column. What am I going to get? Now I'm going to get a negative y sine x y. Minus what? Zero, right? J. And now I need to do the k column. What do I have? 2x mm -hmm. e to the z minus 2y k hat. Um, we're going to clean this up just a touch. There's actually a lot we can clean up. We can, I guess we can not write the zeros. But. So this is negative x sine x y minus x squared e to the z. I will distribute that negative through, so this gives me y sine x y. And then 2x e to the z minus 2y. Now what? Why? This does not equal the zero vector, so it's not conservative. So one of the things we actually just showed is that just because we had a divergence that was zero, because that's what we had for this, the divergence of this was zero, right? That doesn't mean that we have a curl of zero, correct? All right. So let's try the other one then. Same directions. We're going to find out if this is conservative. Or we're hoping to find out it's not, because otherwise our, our, prod, our value doesn't actually help us. Our formula here doesn't help us. Sine x, 2y squared, cosine y. All right, i, j, k. This is the curl of f. Okay, what do I get first? Negative sine y? Right? Minus what? Zero. That's the i vector. Minus, okay, j column, what do I get? Zero minus zero. At zero minus zero, you're right. 
0 minus 0, j, and then plus the k column, 0 minus 0, k, and we were ever so close, what did we actually get? Negative sine of y, 0, 0. Again, still not the zero vector, but we were, we're far closer than we were last time, so this is not conservative. And I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure they're all going to be not conservative, otherwise they wouldn't be asking you to use this theorem to work with them. Make sense? So but you're going to verify, basically, that they're not conservative. Why is it like You have to use, it, it's possibly conservative, right? It stands a chance. Exactly. All right, homework for this section. This is page 1029. Problems 1, 4, 7, 10, 14, 17, 20, and 23. 